Rick, what it means is it's uh, just a one more way for the U.S. to tighten the noose, if you will, on the uh, North Korean regime. It's one more way to initiate more sanctions, what the president said uh, the Treasury Department uh, will do tomorrow. And we'll listen to Sarah Sanders right now, Brooke. Oh, here she is. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for being patient with us. I brought a special guest, so I figured you might be okay if we were a little bit delayed today. As you all know, the president hosted a very productive cabinet meeting this morning and made some news by announcing that the United States has again designated North Korea a state sponsor of terrorism. As the president said, one of the primary goals of his recent Asia trip was to per pursue the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. This designation will impose increased sanctions and penalties on North Korea that will continue our progress toward that goal. Additionally, it is a reminder that North Korea has repeatedly supported acts of international terrorism, including assassinations on foreign soil. The president's position is this, the North Korean regime must be lawful. It must end its unlawful nuclear and ballistic missile development and cease all support for international terrorism. This afternoon, we have Secretary of State Rex Tillerson with us to answer some of your questions on this topic. He's going to come up and uh, make a couple of remarks and then take questions on that topic. And as always, I will be back after that to answer other news of the day. With that, Mr. Secretary. Thanks, Sarah. And, and as Sarah indicated, the President did uh, make the designation earlier today, announced it in the uh, Cabinet meeting. And I think it's really just the latest step in a series of, as you can see, ongoing steps to increase the pressure. I call it the peaceful pressure campaign. The president calls it the maximum pressure campaign. So there's no confusion. They're one and the same. Uh, and I think this is, though, to hold North Korea accountable for a number of actions that they've taken over the last uh, several months, the last year or so. Some of you will know uh, that North Korea was designated as a state sponsor of terrorism back in 1988. So they have been designated before. That designation was lifted in 2008 as part of an effort to negotiate with North Korea an end to their nuclear program. That obviously failed because we can see where we are today. But as a result of actions they've taken, including assassination, uh, assassinations outside of their country, using uh, banned chemical weapons, these are all very, very serious actions on their part that put uh, the public at risk as well. So that, along with a number of other actions that they've taken, resulted in their designation now again as a state sponsor of terrorism. I think, as Sarah indicated, the practical effect of it is it all, we already have many of these actions in place through the current sanctions. It may, though, disrupt and dissuade some third parties from undertaking certain activities with North Korea as it does impose uh, prohibition on a number of other activities that might not be covered <clears throat> by existing sanctions. But I think importantly, this is just continuing to point out North Korea's illicit, Ill unlawful behaviors internationally, uh, and we felt it necessary to reimpose the designation for that reason. So with that, happy to take questions. I'm going to let Sarah referee, because I'm no good at refereeing. Yeah. So good at it. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, Mark. <coughs> yes. Um, is this move an intent to incentivize uh, Kim Jong Un towards negotiations? I think it's been more than 60 days since we've seen some kind of test. Do you think that that timetable is in any way promising? And why wait until we are back in the U.S.? The president said that there was hope for diplomacy when we were in Asia, and this seems to be counter that. No, we still hope for diplomacy, and this is. The, the timing of this is just one of us concluding the process. There is a very specific designation process that we have to go through at the State Department to be able to meet the criteria to make such a designation. And we wanted to ensure we had fully met all those requirements. Again, this is all part of just continuing to turn this pressure up. And we continue to turn the pressure up on North Korea by getting other countries to join and take actions on their own. Uh, we've, we've had other countries in our visit to Vietnam, they have uh, committed that they're going to curtail activities further uh, with North Korea. Malaysia has indicated a curtailment. Singapore has cut off all trade with North Korea. The Philippines have cut off all trade. And uh, just recently, the Deputy Secretary of State has been in Africa. He had meetings with the Sudanese government. Uh, the Sudanese government have traditionally been buying military weapons from North Korea. They now have agreed to halt all those purchases as well. 
So this is being, it's taking effect all around the world, and we think as it takes effect, again, this just continues to tighten the pressure on the Kim regime, all with an intention to have him understand this is only going to get worse until you're ready to come and talk. Uh, specific to the 60-day window, he has not tested in some time. You don't think we're this will trigger? We're hopeful that he continues this quiet period. That's our objective, is that he continue to be quiet as well. Uh, this designation, as I said, is one that we're required to undertake from time to time, and we've been monitoring the situation. We wanted to be sure we had sufficient evidence before making the designation. So this is a process that started uh, actually several months ago. Thank you, Secretary. Um, you mentioned that you're attempting to increase regional pressure against the North Korean regime. Do you have any indication that that is working? And if you haven't seen those indications uh, just yet, how long uh, before uh, do you go down this path before uh, the administration has to begin changing strategies? Well, we get a lot of anecdotal information that it is working, and then we do have our own, you know, intelligence sources as well, uh, and then what the Chinese and others share with us that. I think the general belief is it is having a significant effect on North Korea. Uh, we know that there are current shortages of fuel uh, based upon what we can gather from anecdotally but also from certain intel sources. Uh, we know that, that their revenues are down because a number of the revenue streams are being curtailed now. So I think it is having an effect. Is this the reason we haven't had a provocative act in 60 days? I don't want to suggest to you that that I could say, but we're hopeful this period will continue. And again, I think the President in his address in Seoul, South Korea to the General Assembly, I thought he laid out the case very well to them uh, that he wanted them to come have talks because he wants to deliver a different future to the people of North Korea. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I have a, a couple for you. The first is, well, can you give us an example of a third-party transaction that is now covered, that was not covered by either existing American sanctions or the UN Security Council sanctions? Well, there could be certain dual-use equipment that may not have been covered under previous sanctions that this would prohibit now a third party selling that dual-use. And so, and again, I don't want to suggest to you that the designation is suddenly going to put a whole new layer of, of sanctions on them, because again, I think we already have North Korea so heavily sanctioned in so many ways with the UN. Uh, resolutions that have been undertaken, but this will close a few additional loopholes off. And then you and the President have both referred to assassinations, plural. We obviously all know about the Kim uh, Jong-nam assassination at the airport. Can you give us another exa another example of another assassination on foreign soil? Uh, I don't have anything that I can share with you specifically. There seems to be more unilateral U.S. sanctions against North Korea on the way. Uh, the Treasury is going to announce them tomorrow. Have you given up on getting China to agree to an oil embargo? Uh, we've not given up, and uh, let me say this with China, we continue to talk with them. Uh, first, to ensure that they are fully committed to implementing all the U.N. sanctions, and they have assured us they are, which, as you'll recall, the last round of sanctions imposed a pretty severe restriction on the import of finished products, so fuels, uh, petroleum, diesel, jet fuel, and whatnot. But we have suggested to them, look, you control that oil pipeline that feeds their refinery. Uh, you don't, you know, you can do that unilaterally on your own if you want to increase that pressure. Whether they're doing that or not, we don't know, and it's very difficult for us to know whether they're taking actions to curtail oil uh, supplies to them. Uh, Secretary. Uh Earlier today, President Trump said that this, the Treasury Department is going to be announcing additional sanctions. Tomorrow, he described it as a very large one, the highest level of sanctions. Can you give us any insight into what those additional sanctions may be? Well, I'd, I'd like to leave it to Treasury to announce those tomorrow. They're, they're similar to sanctions we've taken in the past. We're just going out much more broadly now to more entities. But I, I'd like to leave it to their announcement tomorrow. Not not jump the gun on them. And do you all see today's announcement as more symbolic or as something that really does have a lot of teeth to it? Well, I think it, it is very symbolic on the one hand because it just points out again what, how, what a rogue regime this is and how brutal this regime is and how little they care uh, for the value of human life. Uh, so I think if, in that in of itself, I think makes a strong statement of just the nature of this regime. And as I've said, the practical effects may be limited, but we hopefully we're closing off a few loopholes with this. Mara, I'm, 
thank you, Mr. Secretary Mar Eliasson from NPR. If China does not agree to cut to cut off oil shipments to North Korea, how can you possibly put the pre get enough pressure on them to come? Well, their their fuel supplies are already quite constrained, and as I said, we we have evidence that there are fuel shortages in North Korea. Obviously, the civilians are by and large the ones that can't get fuel, so we see long lines of vehicles at petrol stations. We see certain petrol stations that appear to be out of fuel because they're closed when normally they'd be open. So there are indications that fuel supplies are already quite tight. As you know, they only uh, refined a small amount of their fuel needs internally. They only have one refinery that operates, and it operates at a low capacity. So they were heavily dependent on imports of finished fuel products, which have been uh, constrained significantly with the UN sanctions. But is the Chinese action essential? In other words, do, do you re need China to cut off those oil shipments? To I don't know that you. I don't know that all that the cutting off of oil is the magic wand or the silver bullet that is going to bring them to the table. Uh, what I would say is that the North Koreans have demonstrated in the past they have an enormous capacity to withstand a lot. Uh, they'll make their people pay, uh, but they have an enormous capacity to withstand a lot. So I don't want to suggest that we think that one action is all it would take to get them to the, to the table. Margaret Talbot for Bloomberg, thank you. Thanks, sir. Welcome. In our briefing room any time. <laughs> um, I want to pick up on Olivia's question uh, about the assassinations. Uh, was how determinative was that in the specific evidence that you used to make this determination? Um, and uh, I also want to ask you I think you and Ambassador Haley both spent some time with the President, and that's uh, unusual. I know she was in town today. Can you tell us a little bit about that meeting and any substance that came up with? Well, the, on the assassinations, the assassination in Malaysia was a significant event that caused us to really begin to look carefully at what else they might have been doing. As you know, that assassination involved the use of a chemical agent, a very dangerous agent, in a public place. And so that really got our attention. One of the things that we wanted to ensure is that we had a sufficient uh, certainty around their role in that particular assassination. And so we've been working with Malaysian authorities as well and been in conversation with them. Wanted to let them uh, have their own process obviously play out as well. Uh, with respect to Ambassador Hayden and I, we were just both in the cabinet meeting today. Was the threats, uh, I know without getting too much into it, that uh, there had been a suggestion from the North Korean media about some violence directed toward the U.S. president. Was that a determinative factor at all in the decision to make a designation? No. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, I, uh, sorry, Peter Baker, New York Times, thank you for coming. Um, you talked about assassination on foreign soil using a chemical agent. Russia has been accused of assassination on foreign soil, including using polonium uh, in London. Would, should they be considered for the same sort of designation? I think we have to consider every country that would take a, a substance like that and use it illegally. Is there a like that going on right now with Russia? I don't want to comment on that. Secretary Trey Yanks with One American News. Two quick questions for you. Uh, how do you balance the impact of sanctions? Uh, you talked about the people of North Korea paying the price. Um, is this something you're considering uh, when you talk about more sanctions towards the regime of Kim Jong-un? Well, it's always a difficult choice you make when you impose sanctions in terms of who's really going to bear the burden here. The truth of the matter is the people of North Korea already live under enormously difficult conditions. And I think what we're focused on is a mission that's going to change North Korea's trajectory, change their path. That's the best way we can help the North Korean people in the future, is to have Kim Jong-un reverse his nuclear weapons program, allow us and the rest of the world to then engage with them in economic activity that will ultimately provide a better life for his people. And my follow-up question, do you believe that the United States is running out of diplomatic options to respond to the nuclear threat of North Korea? No, I do not. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You talked about the limited intelligence uh, on North Korea and on the regime. Um, is there any evidence of any dissent within <coughs> Pyongyang at all, or possibly reaction against the current government by other members of the Kim family, even, or other opponents to him? Well, I want to be a little careful about how I answer that. What I would comment on is you're well aware of 
of a number of executions that have occurred within his inner circle and within many of the military people that are close to him. So I'll leave it to your own interpretation. Thank you. Hold on, we'll get to some more questions. I know that there is uh, obviously a, a lot of interest today. Uh, thank you again to Secretary of State for coming in and answering questions. Uh, as many of you to shift gears just a little bit on some happier notes, I'm sure a lot of you have started to notice that the Christmas season has officially arrived here at the White House. This afternoon, the First Lady and Baron Trump will receive a beautiful 19-foot uh, Christmas tree, which will serve as the official Christmas tree on display in the Blue Room. The tree will arrive via horse-drawn wagon and will be presented by Jim and Diane Chapman and their son David of Silent Night Evergreens in Wisconsin. The Chapmans were grand champion winners of the 2017 National Christmas Tree Contest, sponsored by the National Christmas Tree Association. The NCTA has presented the official White House Christmas tree since 1966. The grand champion grower wins the privilege of presenting a tree to the White House, and we're excited to have him have them here today for the 52nd time. Uh, as you probably also know, we've got some other holidays like Thanksgiving coming up, and this will be our last press briefing uh, before the Thanksgiving holiday uh, in this room. So I want to share a few things that I'm thankful for, and uh, I think it would be nice for you guys to do so as well before asking your questions. Um, obviously, you probably know, and it's no secret, that I'm clearly very thankful for all of you here in the room. Uh, and I think that goes without saying. But in all seriousness, I'm very thankful for my family, my faith, uh, particularly the thankful for the brave men and women of the military, many of whom are away from their families during the holidays, protecting the freedoms that all of us in this room and across this country enjoy. I'm thankful for the police, the firemen, and first responders who keep us safe here at home. And I'm certainly thankful for the incredible, incredible privilege of serving this president and the American people. So this is how it's going to work today since I'm here and I get to call on you. Uh, if you want to ask a question, I think it's only fair since I've shared what I'm thankful for that you start off with what you're thankful for. So uh, anybody want to be first on what they're thankful for? April, you've been so eager, so I'm going to go with you to start us off on what, on what you're most thankful for. I'm thankful for life. I'm thankful for my children. I'm thankful for 20 years in this job. I'm thankful to be able to talk to you and question you every single day. I feel the gratefulness there. Now my question. Yes, ma'am. I hope you felt the passion of my thankfulness. <laughs> so um, the question is, since I didn't get a chance to ask Secretary Tillerson, there is a black hole when it comes to intelligence when it involves North Korea. And he was talking about, he said, Secretary Tillerson said, things will get worse until they're ready to talk. With that said, the rhetoric is still amping up. What is the concern about the intelligence that we don't know about? What do we know as relates to the nuclear capability of North Korea? And what are the concerns about the things that we don't know? I, I mean, obviously, the biggest concern is making sure that we take steps every single day to protect Americans. That's what the action of the president uh, that he's taken today and that the Treasury Department will take tomorrow is, again, putting that maximum pressure on North Korea to put a very large focus on uh, denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. That's been the top priority, and that's going to continue to be our priority. Uh, we don't feel that they're fully there yet, and we want to keep pushing to make sure uh, that we're taking steps to prevent them uh, from getting any further into this process. I, I, I can't go really deep into specifics uh, on information like that, but certainly, again, the priority of the administration is to protect Americans uh, and partner with our allies and our friends around the globe to do that. And I think that's what you're seeing in some of the actions that took place today and that you'll see again tomorrow. And lastly, on this Twitter, this back and forth Twitter, with the Sorry, April, I'm going to keep moving. I understand, but this know, is a hot but story. But does the president regret? And I'm sure that does one of your colleagues will happily ask for Francesca. Does the president go ahead. regret this tweet? I mean, he came back twice yesterday. April, I'm starting to regret calling on you first. But, but you're still thankful for all of us. I'm part of the group. <laughs> I am, but I don't, I don't want that to go away. So I'm going to move on to one of your colleagues. Francesca, go ahead. Well, I am very thankful for you calling on me right 
regularly as well. But I will I will follow your lead and uh, be thankful for our service members. My brother's a service member and our police. My dad is a police officer, so I'm very thankful for their service. Um, but I want to ask today about something that Kellyanne Conway said this morning on Fox and Friends about the Alabama Senate race. She brought up tax reform and tax cuts and said that the Democrat running in that race would not be a vote for tax cuts. And she did not directly endorse the Republican that's running, Roy Moore. However, it opened the door, I think, to a question that we haven't really discussed in here yet, which is whether the president would be uh, supportive of a writing campaign of someone like Luther Strange, who he supported in the primary, or Jeff Sessions, his attorney general. Both of those are going around. I, actually, I think we have addressed this. I've, I've, I've addressed it uh, quite a few times. But the president feels that it's up to the people of Alabama to make that determination who their next senator will be. Uh, I've answered a number of questions on this topic. And our position hasn't changed uh, over the weekend. It's certainly still the same as it was when I answered those questions on Thursday and on Friday. Do you ask that you, you said whether the president would support a writing campaign? We said we Jeff support Sessions? the people of Alabama making the decision on who their next senator should be. John Decker. Thanks a lot, Sarah. I'm thankful for my health, my family, my faith. I think I live in the best country on the face of the earth. See, isn't this nice? I feel like and, uh, everybody happy. I'm support. thankful, of course, that uh, you address us every day here in the briefing room. Uh, my question is also about the Senate race in Alabama. This is an unusual question because normally we wouldn't ask you a question about the Republican nominee running for uh, statewide office and whether or not the president is supportive of the Republican nominee. But my question is just that. Would you be pleased if Roy Moore wins his Senate race in Alabama? Would the White House be pleased with that outcome? Look, uh, obviously the president wants people uh, both in the House and the Senate that support his agenda. But as I've said, and uh, as the Hatch Act prohibits me from going any further, we certainly think that this is something that the people of Alabama should decide. And I'm not going to be able to weigh in anything further beyond those comments. Blake. Thank you, Sarah. I am uh, thankful for my wife, who is pregnant with our soon to Congratulations. Very exciting. <laughs> thankful for my, my family, my parents. Having Good a luck. Number two only gets a lot harder. Yeah, no. <laughs> Having a fee this week, I'm thankful that they sent me to the University of Michigan and not Ohio State. Go blue. I'll get that out there. <laughs> uh, my question is on taxes as well. Uh, the president seemed to suggest today that Democratic help is all but gone for. Uh, do you still think that you can get Democrats on board? We'd certainly still like to. Uh, frankly, I don't know why Democrats wouldn't want to support uh, tax cuts for the middle class, as we've said many times before. Uh, seems like something they should be running to cast their vote for, and we'd certainly welcome their support if they want to get on board and help that effort. Yeah. Cecilia. Thanks, Sarah. I am thankful for the First Amendment. Uh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. We're thankful for that. Kelly and Conway today. <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> okay. part of it, though. Kelly and Conway. I want to ask the Kelly and Conway a different question a different way though because she she was here on the north lawn and she said that she warned alabama alabama voters not to support doug jones not to be fooled by doug jones so is that the position of this white house that voters are better off voting for someone accused of assaulting teenage girls than a democrat uh, look, as I've answered, I think even for the third or fourth time just today, as well as 10 or 15 times on both Thursday and Friday of last week, the position of the White House hasn't changed. We feel like the people of Alabama should make the determination on who their next senator should but be. she made a clear Jim. suggestion over who they should vote for. And I'm telling, I'm giving you the answer to the position of the White House. Jim. Sarah, well, first of all, I'm grateful for uh, my daughter and my family and uh, <clears throat> the fact that I went to the Ohio State University uh, <laughs> as opposed to Michigan. We'll let that uh, slide. Uh, um, but my question is, does the president really regret intervening in the case of the UCLA basketball players? And what message does that send to uh, other U.S. citizens who may be held captive by a foreign government? Look, the president uh, was certainly very glad and thankful to see the release of the three UCLA athletes by the Chinese government. And frankly, it's really fortunate that the president has built a strong enough relationship with President Xi of China that he was able to help secure the release of the American citizens. Um, whenever the president is able to use his office and those relationships to help American citizens held overseas, he's certainly going to do that. Um, and again, certainly the president was happy to intervene. Um, and 
I think he's made that clear by taking that action upon himself to do that without being asked and certainly something that he's done several times uh, in these brief short 10 months that he's been in office where he's secured the release of several American citizens and brought them home. Steve? Yeah, Sarah, I'm thankful for uh, surviving our 12 days in Asia in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> happy to be back here. Uh, the president uh, has not made uh, a weekly radio uh, broadcast for more than a month now. Have they uh, been scrapped uh, by this administration, and if so, why? No, we're always looking for different ways. Uh, we received quite a few uh, comments and a lot of feedback that the weekly address wasn't being used to its full potential. So we're looking at different ways uh, that we can revamp that and make it where it's more beneficial and actually gets more information out. We'll keep you guys posted as those details happen. Uh, I, I know there certainly will be um, a Thanksgiving message. Uh, I'm not sure on the specifics uh, in the date, but I'd be happy to follow up with you on that front. Jenna. Um, Sarah, I have a really quick Roy Moore question, and then I want to ask you about um, welfare reform. Has the President talked to Roy Moore since November 9th, which is the day that these accusations first came out? Not that I'm aware of. I'm not aware of any conversations. Yeah, and then today the President said that um, wealth form, welfare reform is desperately needed. It needs to be reformed. What, what exactly is he talking about? Is he talking about food stamps? Is he talking about Medicaid? What, what is he talking about in that comment? I think there's no secret. Uh, the president has spoke about this during the campaign uh, and something that he's mentioned briefly uh, since taking office. And when we have specifics on what that will look like, we'll certainly announce them and roll them out. I don't anticipate that happening over the next couple of weeks. We're very focused on tax reform and making sure we get that done by the end of the year. But this is something that the president uh, has a great deal of interest in. And I think you can count on probably the first part of next year, seeing more specifics and details come out on that. Sarah. Zeke. Thanks, Sarah, for the question. Um, you mentioned uh, on Friday the President released an uh, uh, expanded list of uh, uh, potential uh, selectees for the Supreme Court should a vacancy open up. Uh, number one, if you uh, elaborate. Zeke, you did break the rule of not offering anything. Yeah, thank you for the question. Can you uh, explain a little, me a little bit why the President felt it was necessary to um, add to the list that he put out during the campaign? And then also, if you address concerns about the diversity of some of the president's judicial picks, not not the Supreme Court, but more broadly across the federal judiciary, and talk about how the White House uh, uh, sort of values or doesn't value um, uh, diversity among the uh, federal judiciary when it comes to selecting national nominees. So certainly, value diversity not just in the judiciary, but. Uh, uh, across the administration and always look for uh, more ways to grow that, improve that. But in terms of the release on Friday, the president hadn't added any new names in nearly a year uh, and felt like it was a good time to do that. There's nothing more to read into it other than expanding the list uh, should there ever be a potential vacancy and for us to fill. The, the, this administration, the quarter eight analysis, does lag in previous three administrations when it comes to the diversity of the, of the nominees already. Put forward. Can you sort of address why that's the case? I'd have to look at the specifics uh, before I could comment on the study. Margaret. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm thankful also for the First Amendment um, and for this exercise. Uh, do, I think um, it's good for preparation for everybody for Thursday with your family so that you guys will have already thought through what you're thankful we'll for, so you'll be the most prepared. prepared. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, has the, um, can you tell us whether the President or the White House um, actively encouraged the Justice Department um, to move forward with the federal antitrust suit um, uh, against AT&T Time Warner against the deal that's been announced today? No, I'm not aware of any uh, specific action taken by the White House. Is there, do you have a view on that? Uh, on, is you're saying on the front end, no, do you have, would you have any statement about that now? Not at this time. Sarah. Yeah. Sure. Thank yeah. you. Um, I'll pull first my, Sorry, my, so my gratitude. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to fill in for our chief, John Roberts, and I'm grateful to uh, only have a month left. <laughs> one in the oven, so it's my first. I've got a lot to learn. Um, my question is back to the UCLA basketball players. Um, President Trump over the weekend, he called them ungrateful. And I'm just curious because, you know, the players have already apologized in their briefing last week. So what more would President Trump like to see from them? What would, what would satisfy him? 
Look, I, I think that the president, like I said, was happy uh, to intervene. Um, I think it was less about the players and the father, the father of one of the Americans really seemed to have a problem with it. Um, frankly, it didn't seem like the, the father wanted the president to intervene, which I think would, would have been a sad thing if he hadn't, most yeah. likely. And does he, Matthew? Does he want, does he believe that he really should have left the players in jail? Or? No, I think if that's the case, he wouldn't have taken the action that he did uh, and certainly acted uh, in order to help get those individuals released and brought back to the country. Matthew? Sure. So following on that, um, if that's not how he feels, then why did he say that he should have left them in jail? Look, what the president the, was to take yeah, look, the president was, it was a rhetorical response to a criticism by the father. Uh, again, I think the president was happy uh, to see the release of these individuals and have them back in the United States. We'll take one last question. Sarah. John Gizzi. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm thankful for the position I have and the colleagues who are my friends. I'm thankful for my father, 96 years old and going strong, and to my wife, my heroine, uh, thankful to her for saying yes on the fourth request. <laughs> My question is about Zimbabwe. That's the best pivot I've ever seen. Yeah. Will the administration recognize uh, the new regime that apparently is being led by General Chiwenga uh, in Zimbabwe, and will there be any interaction with the new government in Hariri uh, specifically about their cutting back on the influence of China and North Korea in their country? I don't have any uh, announcements on our relationship with Zimbabwe at this time, but certainly we'll make sure and keep you guys posted. Again, want to uh, wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, and thank you for participating in this uh, very fun exercise. We'll be around uh, today and tomorrow. Thanks, guys. All right, so there you have Sarah Sanders. and. Uh, a lot of giving thanks there in that uh, White House uh, briefing room. But let's begin, though, with uh, someone who we, we rarely really see, uh, let alone you know, briefing the press. It was the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson uh, taking questions from the White House press corps, specifically on the news today that the, the Trump administration has decided to uh, agree to designate North Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism. So I've got Michelle Kaczynski and David Chalian and, and Sam uh, Vinograd all here with me. And so, uh, you know, a, a couple of points just on the practical effect. It seemed like the Secretary of State was making the point that we have a, a lot of those actions already in, pl in place, implicit within uh, this this designation, and really this is for dissuading third parties from interactions with with North Korea. But but first, David, just on Rex Tillerson and the you know bizarre last couple of months, uh, starting with the you know moron comment directed toward the president. What do you make of him and his, his appearance and just where we are today? Starting with that and culminating with just last week, his spokesperson at the State Department indicating that there was indeed a problem with morale uh, there uh, at the State Department. Um, so, yes, there is the fascination to watch uh, the Secretary of State, which, who does not seem all that close uh, to the president he serves in the briefing room, uh, speaking there from the White House. But I do think on the substance of what he was saying, Brooke, what was so interesting to hear him say is that while they were touting this new diplomatic step of uh, reasserting this status for North Korea, uh, he made clear this was not the end of the road of diplomatic options and that this was just one in a series of steps to continue to ratchet up pressure, uh, but by no means did he want it to be perceived that this was sort of like an ultimate uh, exasperated moment uh, of some final bit of diplomacy. Michelle, to David's point on Heather Nauert on Friday saying, you know, it's acknowledging publicly that the poor morale at state. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the Secretary of State would acknowledge that himself, and he didn't deny it today when we asked him a question specifically about that. But he did want to take that moment to, to turn around and stay before cameras during this photo op and say that he takes exception with anybody who feels that the State Department is not running well. I mean, he, he made a, a strong statement on that. But again, uh, not denying that there's a morale problem. He said that his redesign, which has garnered some criticism and is seen by many as hurting morale, is actually going to fix 
the morale problem. So there's, there's plenty of questions that remain on there too. But I think when you look at today, um, the dynamic here is always something to be watched. This afternoon, just before he headed to the White House, which was unexpected, at least um, you know, among the press people here at state, he was asked by members of the press about this North Korea issue, because we already knew what the, what the president had stated earlier. But the Secretary of State chose to remain completely silent on this while at the State Department before the State Department press corps. He just turned around. He, he, he didn't even want to say, I'm going to have something to say about this in just a few minutes. I mean, he said nothing about it. Then he appears before the White House press corps and answers all kinds of questions. Um, he even sort of tries to explain what is in this case and in other cases a, a slight difference in language that he has with the president. He said that he calls this the increase the pressure campaign, acknowledging that the president calls it the maximum pressure campaign. So he's saying that he has a slight different, slightly different view there, but he wanted to meld it all together um, and explain why he feels like this would be beneficial, even though we all know that there was some disagreement within the State Department over whether this was a good idea. But it tells you that this is policy that is clearly being directed, motivated by the White House. State Department obviously did the work on this and completed the process of adding them to the list. But it, but this, you know, it, it's very starkly obvious that this was not an idea that came from Secretary of State Tillerson or within the State Department, and, and they tried to push this through. Hmm. Uh, on the substance of the designation, Sam, let me just turn to you. Hearing essentially out of the gate the Secretary of State saying this is all an effort to, quote, turn up the pressure. But then one of the reporters asked the perfect question, which was, well, you know, we thought he was sitting in Seoul speaking in the National Assembly just a couple weeks ago saying to North Korea, you know, let's, let's talk come to the table. And if you have this now state sponsor of terrorism designation from North Korea, does that then negate any efforts of diplomacy? How do you see it? I don't think they're mutually ex exclusive. Okay. I think to deal with North Korea right now, the president is wisely using all tools in his toolkit. Uh, state sponsor designation is one way to increase the pressure in Secretary Tillerson's words. While we also try to add credibility to an actual military strike if North Korea doesn't denuclearize, I was really struck by two things today in the secretary's press briefing. The first is he said that this was a result of an interagency process. So we finally have a situation where the president is using his National Security Council <laughs> and not making policy by tweet, which is something that I feel a little bit better about. Step in the right direction. Indeed, we'll take it. But I was also struck by the fact that Secretary Tillerson was pretty measured in yes. how these sanction would, sanctions would actually have an impact. He actually used the phrase, there is no silver bullet. And I think that's smart. Nothing by itself is going to force North Korea to denuclearize right now. I think it's going to be a combination of factors. Made the note on the measured tone. Be curious to see how the president potentially tweets about it. Let me move on, David Chalian. Let's switch gears and talk to talk about Alabama and the Senate race. The White House, you know, once again saying it's up to the people in the great state of Alabama really to be the ones to decide Roy Moore's fate. Uh, you know, he is the candidate denying all these sexual assault allegations. But Sarah Sanders was questioned on the comment by Kellyanne Conway, suggesting that they now want Moore to win to be able to use his vote for the tax bill. Listen. Doug Jones in Alabama, folks, don't be fooled. He'll be a vote against tax cuts. So vote Roy Moore? I'm telling you that we want the votes in, in, the, in the Senate to get this tax, this tax bill through. So David Chalian, now it's about numbers and taxes, right? Yes, and it's about this White House again trying to have it both ways on this issue. Uh, they don't want... Uh, to have the president out there uh, demanding that Roy Moore step away in the way that Mitch McConnell has, or everyone from Mitch McConnell all the way to Susan Collins. That's a pretty broad spectrum of the Republican Party there. And everyone uh, in, the, uh, in Washington here has been calling for that, except President Trump, who obviously has his own troubled past with uh, allegations against mm -hmm. him. And doesn't want to get crossways with his own base who are supportive of Moore uh, as he was in the primary. So those two factors play into the reason why they don't want to weigh in on Moore. And yet they want to be able to sort of wink and nod, as Sarah Sanders did today, that they want a senator who supports President Trump's agenda. And as Kellyanne was just saying there, she's making the case that Doug Jones is not that person. So therefore, they kind of want 
somebody who's going to support the president's agenda. Well, there's only one person in the race that's going to do that. And yet they don't want uh, to be anywhere near Roy Moore and just say, leave it up to the people of Alabama. So they're trying to have it both ways. Yeah. Um, so then the questions started coming on UCLA, right? Those three basketball players who were in trouble in China uh, right around the time when the president happened to be over there, uh, visiting with President Xi, uh, accused of shoplifting some Louis Vuitton sunglasses, end up getting tossed in, in detention. And the president says that he spoke with President Xi and, you know, worked to get them out. And thanks to me for, you know, doing all of that. We've seen the press, you know, conference with the athletes. They said, I'm sorry, and thank you directly to President Trump. Fast forward to now where the father of one of these players has come out and, and has criticized the president and saying, I'm paraphrasing, you know, maybe he doesn't quite deserve the credit that, that, that he's getting. And so the president, to, to the perhaps surprise of so many people, tweets about this. And at the end of the tweet, David Chalian says, I should have left them in jail. And then you hear, you know, it asked to Sarah Sanders, and clearly it was a note she, she kept going back to. The president was happy to intervene, happy to intervene. And that was simply a rhetorical response because of the criticism of the father. Rhetorical response think? and that of course the president is happy that they're no longer in prison, right? And yeah. so if the president is happy, then why would he threaten that he should have left them there? Oh, that's just a rhetorical response. So we're not supposed to take uh, that seriously, apparently, um, which I, I don't think many people really think that the president would want to leave Americans in, in jail somewhere. Uh, he was clearly in a back and forth with the father, as you notion, uh, as you suggested. But the, the notion that Sarah Sanders from the podium now has to separate out this is a, a rhetorical flourish of the president. Um, again, this is the president of the United States who's writing in what we have been told by this White House to consider official White House statements, a tweet that was threatening that perhaps the better outcome would leave them in jail. She walked that back today. She had to reverse yeah. the president's words because they knew that that went too far. I'm going to use your point and uh, put it to my next guest, David Chalian. Thank you. And Sam and thank Michelle, you. thank you all as well here. Let's talk more about this UCLA story with me now. Calvin Washington, ESPN radio host uh, of Afternoons with Marcellus Kelvin and ED and CNN contributor Michael D'Antonio, author of the, the Truth About Trump. Gentlemen, your appearance is mighty timely. Um, just having that, you know, White House press conference. And, and Michael D'Antonio, I mean, to, to David Chalian's point, the way in which Sarah Sanders had to walk back the president saying should have left him in jail with, oh, no, no, that was a rhetorical response. What did you think of that? Well, I think we all have people in our lives and maybe some of them will come around on Thanksgiving who say terrible things and then tell us it's a joke. You know, the the insult that, oh, no, I'm just kidding, and leave them in China in prison. Oh, no, he's just kidding. No, this is actually the kind of thing that narcissists who abuse situations indulge in all the time. So the president here is engaged in a game with Mr. Ball. I mean, he, Mr. Ball, I mean, is a very astute uh self-publicizing fellow. He knew how to get the president's attention. Um, he does it for personal and probably financial gain. Uh, the president is signaling to his base. He always seems to attack people of color or women. He doesn't seem to be very inclined to attack white males, and I think that's a signal. Um, but at the end of the day, he's got Sarah Sanders going out and saying, oh, he's just kidding. Uh, so we can all read into it what we'd like, and the president gets to play it every which way. All right. You made a couple great points. Let me pick, pick them apart. First, Kelvin, um, to you on you know, the latter point about the president doesn't seem to have an inc inclination of, of you know, criticizing or taking on white males. I mean, when you look at the, the theme... Uh, if we want to call it that, and I think it sort of seems to be, you have these basketball players he's taken on, NFL players, uh, you know, not these high-profile NBA coaches, Popovich, Kerr, or even most recently with that video Eminem, not saying a word. Why do you think? Uh, it, it could be what Michael pointed out, or it also could be just simply who he deems, Brooke, as people of power. Uh, people who are, you know, for instance, you remember Popovich, he is a powerful person within the NBA. Eminem, maybe one of the most popular rappers of all time. Well, uh, clearly he is. So maybe it's people he deem also who has power. He does not want to challenge that. Um, 
I'm not exactly sure, but again, the idea that we would have to dissect his words and dissect each tweet, uh, well, he didn't mean that one, or that was rhetorical, or that one was only a joke. That's not really, uh, that shouldn't be the burden that we have to carry. It should be, we're taking you at your word, uh, which I, again, why I think it was very, very interesting, the words that he chose to say about these players. Brooke, I thought we were taught if you do something right, out of the kindness of your heart, you're not supposed to expect to be thanked for. You're supposed to do the right thing. And so the idea that he didn't even allow the players to say thank you. He said they better say thank you before their press conference where eventually they did thank him. And so the idea that if my father, in Leangelo Ball's case, he doesn't, he doesn't feel uh, or show enough gratitude that that somehow is an implication of how I feel when I've already told you I said thank you. So now you want me to remain in jail. I can see how the players and other people will be offended by that. Listen, I know what my mom taught me. I know what, you know, maybe what your mom taught you about not needing all the, the thanks, right? But mm -hmm. not everyone is created equal, so there's that. Then there's, you know, you mentioned uh, it, LeVar Ball is the dad, right, who this is, this is about a little bit lately, the father of one of those, those players. And so he told ESPN, what was Trump over there for? Don't tell me nothing. Everybody wants to make it seem like he helped me out. So I was reading more about this, this, this dad, and one you, you know, USA reporter called him the basketball equivalent of a Kardashian for his relentless pursuit, you know, the family's growing brand. And many are suggesting these two actually have quite a bit in common. Kelvin. Yeah, well, they do. They do. They both know how to manipulate us, the media. They know how to use us to get out their points and their agenda. So that they definitely have that in common. Um, but what LeVar Ball has really done is started an empire. As Michael was alluding to, he's a very shrewd businessman. And he is starting it, of course, within the family with his sons. They have a Facebook television show. They have their own brand, a big baller brand. And they are trying to, of course, build upon this and grow this. Um, one thing I will say, though, even when he doesn't, I don't often agree with some of the things he says or some of the things he does. I will say LeVar Ball, from what it seems to be, is a great father. LeVar Ball seems to be highly interested in the development of his sons. He also seems to be there for his wife who suffered a stroke, and he's personally re rehabbing her back to health. So there's kind of you have to dissect the businessman who is kind of WWE. He'll say whatever just to get your attention. And then also the, the man himself who is, seems to be a great father. So I do want to acknowledge that there is a distinction between the two. But they have that in common. If there's well, a microphone, bet, I'm, I'm, if there's a camera, they're going to say something. I got you, and I'm sure you know other folks would probably say the same about Donald Trump. Kelvin and Michael, thank you so much. Good to see both thank of you. you. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, coming up next.